My name is Julian Willard. And I'm Jim Mack, and this is Pineal Express, where trains of thought intersect. Dr. Christy Winters describes herself as, quote, liberal, atheist, social scientist, feminist, and nerd. She studies elections and political attitudes, often from a gender studies lens. She also has a YouTube channel, where she documents and critiques trends in the political discourse, including the rise of the alt-right. We invited Christy Winters onto Pineal Express to discuss social science research and feminism in our current political context. All right, welcome Christy Winters to Pineal Express. Hi there. So I'd like to start the conversation on the topic of qualitative research in the social sciences. You've been an advocate for the importance of qualitative research. What is qualitative research and how does it differ from other approaches to data collection like quantitative research? Sure, happy to answer that question. Well, the first thing is, uh, let's start with quantitative research because that's sort of where social science started. The social sciences initially really were quite led by the natural sciences in that um, if you think about the natural sciences, you observe the world and you make measurements and you look at relationships and you try to posit causal relationships between phenomenon and then you develop theories of how they could work and then you test the theories. And that's very much the approach that the social sciences also picked up in the 1960s, especially. I mean, public opinion polling and other things have been going since about the 1940s. But as a as a discipline, it's sort of like the baby boomer generation, where the social sciences sort of really exploded and expanded and have become the discipline that we know today. So they initially were looking at causal relationships because they modeled themselves as social sciences. They're taking the scientific method, but applying it to the social world. But they didn't really question the assumptions <laughs> of the science, scientific process, whether, I mean, not to say nobody did, but the assumption was, you know, if you wanted to understand a causal relationship in the social world, you'd be best off applying the, the methods found in the natural sciences, which is to look for relationships between, uh, look for um, outcomes and then things that might influence those outcomes, observe them, try to come up with concepts and measurements, and then uh, you know, you've got your theories of why you think X impacts on Y, and you test them. And the way we test them in the social sciences is by asking people survey questions. Those survey questions, though, have to meet the scientific criteria for validity. Validity, and there are other con uh, concepts we use in the social sciences to make sure that we're measuring what we think we're measuring. And uh, validity is is basically, are you measuring what you want to measure? And that's not a yes or no question. It's something that we have to test and investigate and check from time to time. So we use these surveys and we present people with identically worded questions and we give them a range of options to choose from so that everybody has the same stimulus from an experimental science point of view. And uh, we also have very clear categories into which the responses can be sorted. And from that, I mean, the social sciences survey methodologies, we've learned a lot about people's attitudes and life cycle effects and socialization, political socialization, for example. But the thing about the, that quantitative method, though, is that it's it's deductive. It's taking a theory and applying it to the to the world, to data, in order to test it. And because it's deductive, we end up having the political scientists, who are usually very well educated and have a deep knowledge of very abstract concepts, writing the questions for people who are normal. <laughs> and so there are some questions about whether or not survey data can really fully explain human behavior because it's a very top-down way of organizing the responses that people can respond to, you know, the, the, the choices they have in terms of their answers, but also the way the questions themselves are framed and what kinds of questions get asked. Those aren't determined by people answering the surveys. Now, feminist scholars, especially in psychology, had a lot of critiques of this sort of applying the natural science methods to the social world because their very valid objection is, well, we're dealing with people. We're not dealing with atoms and neutrons and positrons and things. And uh, we have a relationship. Like, you know, why should we have this really distant, almost, you know, medical relationship between the participants and, and the survey researchers, especially since survey researchers themselves, political scientists, can't know everything. So a way of finding out what people are thinking and how they talk about things and what they value is to ask them. <laughs> and when you ask people open-ended questions, that is qualitative research. And by qualitative, you just mean that you can't 
apply the same kind of methods that you apply in the, the scientific and the to the social sciences from a, a naturalistic point of view. Instead, you have to be more of a listener and you have to think about topics and then uh, try to think about framing questions in a way that allow you to find out information that maybe you didn't know before. The other important part of qualitative research is that you can hear how people talk about things. And that means you can, if you, you can sometimes hear media echoes or what we call them. And that's when people basically repeat things they hear in the news. But this also tells you what they pay attention to and maybe what kind of news they're consuming. And it might give you an insight into how they view that topic. So qualitative research is inductive in that we go from observation to theory. We don't go from theory to testing with the data. Instead, we, uh, w my approach in my research, we asked people lots and lots of questions uh, from all over Britain. After that, we took their answers and we read through them and we read through them again and again, looking for patterns in the data that weren't just about one person, but in our case, sort of transcended maybe uh, whether it was a man or woman responding or someone from England versus Scotland, other parts of, you know, or, or Wales. And by seeing these patterns emerge independently from a lot of different areas, we can then take that and say, okay, well, we got the, maybe the start of a theory here. And this is the inductive process of the natural sciences. A quick example I can tell you is that when we asked people after, during, I'm sorry, before the election, how are you going to vote in the upcoming election? We looked at the the way that people talked about their vote choice uh, process, like how they thought about how they could vote. And we were stunned to find that more than half of the respondents would first preface their decisions by explaining the dynamics of their own constituency. So this, they would say, I live in a really safe conservative seat. So it kind of doesn't matter who I vote for because the conservatives are going to win. Therefore, I have to really think about how I want to use my vote. Or they would say, my seat is very marginal, so I feel like I, you know, this time the race is really close, and so I'm I'm paying really close attention and deciding, you know, should I best place my vote over here or over there in order to sway the election based on the marginality. And this idea that people's vote choices are constrained by the districts that they live in is something that political scientists are aware of, but it was surprising to us how often that um, that decision itself was sort of independent of what they actually wanted to happen on the national level, which is not how we think about vote choice. And so I think this is an example of how, you know, we could then take those findings and say, you know, one of the things you should definitely consider when evaluating how people vote in an election is maybe first consider um, the who the the marginality or the safeness of their constituency. Another thing we find is that people want to vote for winners. So someone will say, you know, well, the conservatives are going to win in my constituency. They're pretty close to my policy, so I'm probably going to vote for them. And that's not really how we think about vote choice a lot of times. So I do think that there's a lot of value to be gained from experts actually just listening to people, you know, so-called experts, um, listening to people who are who have expertise or have knowledge that we don't have access to, but we could if we just let them talk. Thank you for, for that analysis. Another project that you have been working on is analyzing and critiquing the alt-right. It strikes me the ideology of the alt-right is a reflection of anxieties within a diminishing white population, uh, as well as a movement towards anti-intellectualism. Given your background as a social scientist, how do you understand the rise of the alt-right and how do you recommend that people combat their ideas? Mm -hmm. All right. Well, I'll start with the first part. What contributes to the rise of the alt-right? If we look back at the data and you look at the political discourse, and by discourse, I just mean the way people talk about something. So in this case, we're talking about how people talk about politics. There has been a, a strain of sort of white supremacy that has existed in the United States and it can go all the way back to slavery. The discourse of the alt-right is just, we're calling it the alt-right, but it's a very old discourse. So we had these um, waves of kind of, you know, progressive, regressive, you know, you had the Civil War and so you had the end of slavery, but then you had Jim Crow. Um, you had the civil rights movement and then you, you know, seeing some sort of kinds of, of backlash which get displaced into other areas. The war on crime, for instance, was very um, racially motivated or framed in American politics in the 1980s. We had, you know, it's from the 80s and the 90s, this rise of what is called PC culture. PC culture 
really just means it became socially unacceptable to use bigoted language in public. And I don't think we realized how much we had really cleaned up society uh, through PC culture when we were having these sort of debates about it. And, you know, can white people say the N-word and all this sort of thing? Um, we didn't have an active segment of society transgressing political correctness just for the sake of it. Uh, so we had for a while some, I think, social progress in terms of how we talked about things. And again, this sort of underbelly of, of racism and white supremacy that's existed in the United States, it kind of you know went out of fashion. But with Trump, Trump very much is part of that psyche. The language, the way he uses language is, is you know, um, perfect for for the alt-right. And his willingness to say incredibly offensive things, and, and then he just got away with it. There were no consequences for his outrageous comments, his racist comments, his uh, sexual predations, um, all the various ways that he's offended sensibilities in American society for, for people who care about being decent human beings. And so um, what, he's, what Trump has basically done is embolden people who were previously not willing to say those kinds of things in public to say them again. And also by kind of giving a wink and a nod to white supremacists, the whole sort of there were, you know, bad people on both sides, they read that as um, basically support. And it again, further emboldens them to be open about their platform. So really, the, the potential for fascist activity in the United States exists with us all the time. The question is, you know, maybe in some ways it's still a bit of a hangover from the economic crisis of 2008, but you have people who are still not back to where they were financially before the crash, and you have um, a lot of displacement in a society, economic displacement with, with moving of jobs to other countries, and also an increasing browning, you're going to say, of America. And so um, people who have many grievances there is a certain demographic that will find that white supremacy very attractive. And we're seeing a lot more, I think disproportionately, of course, um, white guys um, who are openly discussing these things now because they feel like, it, well, it comes under the banner of, of free speech. So it's a sort of a, a, in my opinion, the way that I look at it, it's a collection. It's like when a perfect storm happens, it's not just one thing that creates the perfect storm. You have to have conditions that are right in order to create the monster storm. And the conditions you existed in with through Trump, they've really kind of come together and synthesized in a way that we haven't seen for a very long time. And and personally, I I didn't live through the Red Scare, but you know, I'm not that old. But I am very concerned about the attacks on our institutions and the the collaboration of places like Fox News and the Republicans in Congress to attack the FBI. This is, in some ways, the institutional expression of that kind of, of you know, of fascist tendencies in, in American society. And I, I'm finding it truly terrifying. Uh, what can we do, right? That was the next question. Uh, you know, I, I guess if there was a silver bullet, um, we wouldn't have had Hitler. But Sorry, I'm, I'm stumbling because it, it is a very difficult question to, to answer because there isn't a silver bullet. Part of it is economic recovery. I mean, if we actually had economic policies that provided people with a basic standard of living that was, um, you know, they didn't feel like they were scraping by, that immediately eases a lot of tension. But the American economy, especially with the Republicans, the way that they're organizing the tax structure, the way they're going after um, the one federal health care program that people are, you know, can get access to health care through, all of it is perpetuating that basically, you know, sort of wage slavery, working from paycheck to paycheck and, and never really feeling like you have any financial security. The other problem, too, is, you know, white people, we got to do our bit. We can't just let our friends make racist jokes and not react even when we object because we don't feel like we want to speak up or we don't want to have those confrontations. The fact is that Black Lives Matter can march all they want. And people who are working for, you know, people who are Hispanic can say all they want, but there is a level of, a level of credibility that a racist will give to another white person that they won't give it to anyone else. Just like somebody who's incredibly sexist. 
will listen to men saying something that they wouldn't listen to a woman say. And somehow the same words coming out of a different mouth, they'll accept. And we can't expect African Americans or Hispanic Americans to solve the problem of racism in America. The biggest player in solving that problem is white people. So I think that would be uh, two things is economic recovery would be a great help. And two, I think more moral ownership of racism in America um, by white Americans would also make a huge difference. Yeah. And one such figure that has become you know, a hero to some on the alt-right is Canadian psychologist Jordan Peterson. Uh, Jordan Peterson has made a name for himself on various new media platforms calling out what he perceives to be a societal threat, specifically cultural Marxist postmodernists, basically anyone on the left. You know, he argues that this left-leaning ideology gets promoted on college campuses and therefore seeps into the societal consciousness of the West. And and briefly, just, just to lay out his argument um, for why he feels uh, this uh, leftism is a detriment to society is that for him, it's rooted in the framework of evolutionary biological dominance hierarchies. You know, he says that the animal kingdom naturally has dominance hierarchical struggles that are predictable and take the form of archetypes, which he draws on Carl Jung's work and uh, the hero's journey theme in literature, which he says reflects this evolutionary biological reality. And lastly, he concludes that you know, drawing on Nietzsche that saving Western civilization is the means in which we defeat this left ideological threat because it is Western civilization that allows us to undertake the hero's journey and that prevents the dissolving of societal consciousness into moral relativism. So I was wondering if you could point out for us where Jordan Peterson goes wrong and the ways in which the social sciences, including gender studies, undercuts his rigid evolutionary biological narrative. Well, well, he gets it wrong so many ways <laughs> from my from my perspective. Um, you said a lot of things there. It was really good to hear the question the whole way through, but could you kind of break it up into to four parts? Because it felt like there was like at least that many parts in it. Yeah. So I guess we can start by the fact that Jordan Peterson has rose in popularity um, by targeting the left specifically on college campuses. Right. And, you know, I, I'm sure Jordan Peterson in his field where he has peer review before something gets published and, and he has to respond to it and improve his paper, um, you know, his findings there are peer reviewed and they're available and, and I think people should read them. Uh, kind of when he moves into, you know, postmodernism and, and other things, he's giving his opinion. He's not an expert anymore. And one of the things that I, I'm actually quite sort of confounded at when it comes to a critique of postmodernism is that what what postmodernism really is is it's moving by, beyond an enlightenment mindset i mentioned before about how the social sciences took their lead from the natural sciences and the natural sciences came out of the enlightenment and in that enlightenment the idea was kind of simplicity nature performs things in very routine ways you know if you have um, basically regular water at sea level it'll boil at 100 degrees celsius it, it will do that all over the globe and so there, the idea was if you found your explanation, you could explain pretty much everything. Gravity, if you figure out the calculations, you can make calculations across the world. It doesn't matter. Gravity is going to affect everything the same way. This idea of um, great explanations, sort of grand narratives, the way that we could figure everything out was very much part of the Enlightenment. And postmodernism, and in some ways, you know, you can actually tie postmodernism to, to Nietzsche in some ways, but that idea is basically sort of unpacking and questioning these assumptions about things like there being grand narratives even in the first place or questioning our received moral frameworks and as if they were somehow written in stone and not able to be changed in any meaningful way. Postmodernism is really just kind of questioning the idea that you can have a simple answer to really complex questions. And when you say things like truth, what do you really mean? And so it, it's it's skepticism sort of applied to ourselves. Like, well, how do we derive our knowledge and, um, you know, what things kind of have meaning? Now, for people who, like Jordan Peterson, who is a, a very devout man of faith, the idea that postmodernism undermines the certainty of something like God in a natural order um, is very upsetting. It seems to be attacking the very foundations of how societies should be structured. But the fact is, and kind of coming on to, I think, one of the other points you were 
talking about regarding Peterson is that, yes, in nature, there are hierarchies, but we're not hippopotamus. We are not monkeys. We're not snakes. You know, we are conscious beings. And a very common error I sometimes or I see on Twitter and other places is, well, you know, human beings reproduce by male to female sexual reproduction. Therefore, that's the only normal, natural, moral way of having sex. And this comes back to a critique that was identified by Hume during the Enlightenment, the is-ought distinction. He said that a lot of people will say, well, it is the case that we have, I, he wouldn't say that, maybe say this, but I'll say it, canine teeth. Because we have canine teeth, therefore we should eat meat. And the really important step here is you're going from an observation of what is, and from that deriving your conclusion of what ought to be. But the fact is, there's no necessary reason why we have to eat just because we have teeth that can tear flesh. Um, you're, you're sort of making a step from the natural to the normal without justifying why it's normal. And this is what I think Peterson uh, sounds like, you know, from your description, what's going on. You have a situation where you have these, you know, people are used to thinking about sex as uh, in two categories of man, woman, and we have this tradition of, you know, male headed households and society had functioned for a long time. And especially for, you know, white guys in a majority white society, and especially for men who are arguing for male power, uh, preserving white power and preserving male power is obviously very much in their own self-interest. But is it really for the good of society? And, um, you know, questioning that gender studies, now I'm a, I'm a political scientist, not a gender studies expert, but I certainly use the theories in the literature that critique our assumptions about what is normal based simply on the fact that we've inherited social structures from the time when we were, you know, just coming down from the trees and walking through the savannas. Just because we've always done it that way doesn't mean it's right to do it. And um, yeah, and also the same thing with this sort of gender binary. We know from genetics now that there are a number of ways that X and Y chromosomes can be combined. So we can't put everyone, we can't force, you know, if someone's XXY or XYY or something, uh, some other combination, they need their own category. You can't just say they're the same as XX or XY. And that too breaks down this idea of, of sort of simplicity and nature and the grand narrative about the roles of men and women in society and in our lives. So I just think just fundamentally, we have a very different first principles when it comes to evaluating human flourishing, the human good, and and what an ideal society could look like. Yeah, I think that's great, Christy. I think that uh, Jordan Peterson's biological essentialism is not critiqued enough in the discourse. And so I really thank you for doing that there. I think that is an important discussion to have. And we do have a little bit more to uh, ask about Jordan Peterson. So Julian, if you want to ask the next. Yeah, I, I just wanted to talk a little bit about cultural Marxism, because I, I recently heard you <laughs> break this down a little bit. And I thought maybe you could break this down for listeners. Well, cultural Marxism is a concept that I actually is a bit of a, a nebulous concept to myself as well. What it seems to be from what I've heard people say, uh, cultural Marxism has something to do with links to the Frankfurt School, links to the idea of using culture to transmit information and uh, somehow like destroying society. I guess you know, the problem with cultural Marxism too often is that people use it against anything they don't like. And therefore, it becomes very difficult to say, okay, well, you know, if you're going to use it against everything you don't like, is everything cultural Marxism? You know, is, so I, I find it a very poorly defined concept. I also just don't understand how the two words go together myself. So maybe I'm doing more of a critique of cultural Marxism than explaining it, mostly because I think it's, it's nonsense. You know, if you look at the term Marxism, one way we could summarize Marxism is that it's really focused on the means of production and the idea of who owns the product of your labor and whether or not it's the people who own the capital and own the business or is it the people who make the product who are putting their labor into it and how do you balance these interests culture is everything it, you know, it well it's not economics but it's you know art and it's literature and it's just society in general 
So for me, the, the two words of cultural Marxism don't even go together because to me, cultural Marxism would be some sort of Marxist take on how do we use a proletariat model of creating things like art or creating things like um, music or creating the kind of society, the cultures that we want to inhabit. And we clearly exist on a capitalist cultural model. <laughs> you know, movies in Hollywood aren't always made because they're good. Uh, Transformer movies are made because they're going to make a lot of money. <laughs> um, you know, so, but is that cultural Marxism? I don't know. And this is why, again, I, I have a real problem with the term. And when people use it, to me, it's more of a dog whistle in terms of their what they want to communicate about their ideology and their critique than actually applying it specifically to an instance and explaining how it's cultural Marxism and what deleterious effects it has and why it needs to be stopped or changed or defunded or fill in the blank. I think the way that you uh, started that description as it's a nebulous concept, I I definitely agree with that. It's it's kind of something <laughs> that is hard to wrap your head around. Um, just to switch gears a little bit, um, I've noticed uh, some of your focus has been on the role of the fundamental attribution error. Uh, can you explain the fundamental attribution error and the ways in which it impacts our political attitudes and discourse? Sure, of course. I, I most recently talked about this in a hangout I did with Destiny, but the, I learned about the fundamental attribution error from watching a series given by Dr. Paul Bloom, which is available on iTunes and on YouTube. It's an introduction to psychology course, and it's offered by Yale. Pretty sure it's either Stanford or Yale, but I'm pretty sure it's Yale. And it's interesting to understand the fundamental attribution error when we come to looking at people and how they react to groups or people who aren't themselves. The basis of the, the term is observing that people tend to, when they mess up, tend to give ex explanations that explain the context around them that produce the bad outcome. So if you did poorly on your exam, you would say, oh, well, you know, I really had uh, an extra shift at work I had to pull because there was an emergency and I ended up losing some time. And then I ended up, you know, like not getting enough sleep. And so on the day of the exam, I felt really bad and I had a hard time concentrating. That's why I did poorly. But if you were to ask that person, you know, a different context about someone they don't know about why they did, or someone they very vaguely knew about why they did poorly on that exam, for instance, they'll say, oh, they're just lazy, or they didn't organize their time very well, or, you know, they went out and got drunk instead of studying, whatever it would be, they attribute the failure to the person's personal character, their character flaws. Whereas in the same situation, they would apply that context to themselves. So a way to look at it is if you ever had somebody who criticizes people who use food stamps, but who themselves used food stamps, and they would say, oh, you know, people on food stamps are lazy and they need to get a job, whatever else, they're bad people and, you know, they're scroungers or whatever else. But when I needed food stamps, it was only for a short period of time. And, you know, I got on and I got off right away and I've never been back since. Th this is how we sort of stop empathy. And it's not, you know, it's, it's a cognitive bias that we're sort of born with and also can be reinforced by culture. And certainly I would say the discourse on the Republican side tends to be very much blaming poor people who can't get jobs or who can't get better paying jobs instead of blaming employers for automating their services and laying a bunch of people off and moving their factories overseas. And also, you know, paying people such low wages that they qualify for food stamps and Medicaid, thereby displacing their business costs onto the taxpayers. Um, you know, so the, it's not like people who are on food stamps want to be on food stamps, and yet we treat them, some people will treat them as if um, they're fundamentally flawed human beings. And that is, uh, ba the basis of that is the uh, fundamental attribution error. Excellent. Thank you for that, uh, Christy. I want to kind of go back a little bit and discuss some gender-related topics uh, from a social science lens. Given your training as a social scientist, do you have a critique of how gender essentialism manifests itself in the scientific literature? Um, and, I, and I'm asking this question in light of the James Damore memo and the increased attention lately to the alleged biological causes of gender imbalance in STEM jobs. Right. My doctoral research actually focused on investigating the question, is biological sex a good proxy for the sort of social roles of men and women in a society? And this idea of you know, biological essentialism or gender essentialism 
assumes that because of a cat, uh, your your category, your your gender, your sex category, or your um, well, your biological category, you necessarily have certain aspects to your personality that are immutable that everybody has as a consequence of of being a man or being a woman. If we're going to ex- kind of exclude non-binary trans people here, um, just for the sake of simplicity, the um, the problem with that though is that there's really no evidence. <laughs> There's, the, biological essentialism is, is is not a good theory because it doesn't actually account for what we observe. We actually see far more variation it, between individuals than than we would see if biological or gender essentialism was an actual causal force, looking at it from a quant's point of view. For instance, if it was the case that having a baby was a necessary part of being a woman, Every woman, without exception, whether or not she could have a child, would want a child. And yet, myself, I am an example, and I know many other women um, who really aren't interested in having babies. And they don't, you know, from my side, it's not that I dislike babies. I just, it was never something I felt driven by biology to do. It's never something I've wanted in my life. So where do I fit in biological essentialism, I'm this sort of outlier. So by a biological essentialist point of view, I am a perversion. I am an aberration. I am wrong. But am I? Do you have to want a child in order to be a full human being? I don't think so. But uh, biological essentialism, for instance, could take something like reproduction and, and tie it to a person's inherent nature. It's just not a good theory. We, we again, we don't see that. And in my research, what I found was that people's attitudes, whether or not they were sort of more aggressive, and they had a high sense of their own agency, uh, imp- you know, sort of competitive, independent, uh, willing to put themselves forward. These are norms or values that are tied to being masculine. Um, and then I also measured, I uh, asked people about whether or not they felt you know, kind to others and connected with others, basically the more nurturing part of our human nature, these what's called communal measures, which are more associated with feminine. Um, but that doesn't mean that somebody, a guy, can't really feel connected to other people, but not really feel competitive or really want to you know, be quite aggressive in going out in the world or feel his own sense of agency. So if a man scores really high on measures of communion, is he somehow not a man? No, he's a guy who has a different set of values from maybe the average guy, but it doesn't make him less of anything. And in my research, um, this, these attitudes, these sort of comportments of agency or communion toward political attitudes or views or even a left-right scale – explained the outcomes better than just knowing whether the person said they were a man or woman. So uh, just to say, it was not always that like these measures always made sex statistically significant would be the scientific term here. Um, Sometimes, most of the time, sex did become insignificant. Sometimes um, it was like they were both significant depending on sort of what I was looking at. But the conclusion of my thesis was you can't look at a measure like man, woman in a model and say, oh, women are this and men are that. There are actually better measures out there. There's also, I want to say, another error that social scientists have tended to make, which is to use something like a biological essentialism or at least a sexual stereotype in place of actually doing the research. So one of the things that we often find is that in British data, women are more likely to score higher in measures of censorship than men are sort of uh, an authoritarian, libertarian scale, like in terms of, a, you know, sh- should we have censorship for the benefit of society? Women are more likely to say they agree or strongly agree than men are. And when you would ask an, your average political scientist, well, why would women score higher? They wouldn't tell the honest truth, which is we don't know because we haven't tested it yet. What they would say is, well, women tend to be mothers and mothers have our primary caregivers and spend a lot of time with their children, especially when they're young. And so they probably want to have a society that doesn't have naked women or whatever else violent things, you know, easily displayed in the society. And that's why they're more for censorship, which sounds reasonable. But you know what? There's no basis in evidence for that because they haven't asked women, well, why are you more in favor of censorship? Or why do you favor censorship? And that's where we tend to be sometimes a bit sloppy, even in the social sciences, not really reflecting on the way that our assumptions about what women and men should be or are can um, influence the way we interpret the data as a replacement for actually finding out.
Yeah, I completely agree with you on every point, Christy. I think that the essentialist view with respect to gender, first of all, it's reductive because it too often ignores the role of culture. But I also notice that it's poorly supported by the science, like you're mentioning. There's a great book out there you may have read by Cordelia Fine, Delusions of Gender, that is a tour de force in really examining the actual science behind claims about male and female brains. And oftentimes I notice the way that the discourse occurs is that there is a faction that says, oh, well, it's obvious science that you know, men are more hardwired to be more systematic or more skilled on average in STEM, for instance, and women are supposedly more hardwired to be more empathetic and more verbal. Um, however, the data really doesn't bear that out if you actually look at if you actually look at the science itself. So it's not merely just that there's a political correct agenda here to push one thing in place mm-hmm. of science. It's that the science itself poorly supports biological essentialism. Um, So, you know, on the topic of gender, um, I'd like to discuss patriarchy. You've been a vocal critic of patriarchy on your YouTube channel and on other platforms like Twitter. Uh, Just as white men need to combat racism, as you said, I I think it's pretty obvious that men need to combat misogyny. Now that we're in the midst of the Me Too movement, I'm wondering if you have any predictions to make concerning the extent to which Me Too-style feminism in the public discourse will reshape the gendered power dynamics in society. Right. It's been incredibly fascinating. I've never in my lifetime seen anything quite like Me Too. And Me Too has been incredibly important, and I think it will continue because, as I said on Twitter recently, a generation has realized that they don't have to suffer in silence the way their mothers did. Women now, when they experience harassment, and men too, as a consequence of Me Too, they are more emboldened to come forward and to make a complaint. And because of the awareness the Me Too campaign has has produced and the way that we've seen consequences for this kind of bad behavior, taking down very powerful men, people now also feel that uh, there's a pressure to respond Whereas before, they probably would have just covered it up or tried to make it go away. I think that the the Me Too movement will continue because women are, who are getting older now and hopefully girls in their teens who are aware of Me Too will have a different attitude toward dealing with sexual harassment or abuse and feel that they will be more believed. Also, that when they go to tell friends and family that they'll be supported in pursuing Uh, you know, coming out or filing a complaint or pressing a charge because of Me Too. So I I do think that it has fundamentally transformed in America, and and there are some knock-on effects around the world as well, but certainly in America, it it feels like there's been a a sea change. And I I do think it's for the better because although there are some men who complain (laughs) about it, this whole thing, you know, like, what do um, I don't now I have to pay attention to you know my body language or I have to pay attention to what I say to my colleagues and I have to um, check my own behavior to make sure I'm not giving off the wrong impression and uh, all women in the world are like yeah we do that every day right yeah how burdensome <laughs> so, right yeah exactly um, but for that you've got a lot of guys too who I've been really heartened by even articles uh, something on Vox was recently posted about a guy writing a piece anonymously saying, I thought I was one of the good guys until I read the Azaria um, article, and then I realized that was me. And there's a greater deal of honesty, I think, in younger men. I'm sorry, like, I'm in my mid-40s, so I'm talking about like, kind of cohorts here. But I think, you know, when you talk about the millennial generation are probably the most, I have a lot of hope that not every single person will change, but that in the aggregate, more men are hearing these critiques and actually listening and taking them on and not just dismissing them. Um, and then also, as you say, you know, it's not a not, you know, if, if there's sexual harassment in the workplace, we shouldn't say it should be okay for the women to report it. It should be okay for their male colleagues to report it too. Hey, I saw something and it made me uncomfortable and I think it made her uncomfortable, but you know, I don't know if she wants to talk to you or something. Um, and I think that all that adds to an environment where we can actually get beyond sexual harassment in the workplace and get beyond these kinds of situations where people with power, and they're disproportionately men because men disproportionately hold positions of power, not only feel like they can use that position of power to get laid, uh, 
but they can use the structures of power to cover up when they go too far. Yeah, I like the conversation that we're having about consent because of the Me Too movement. You talked about cohorts, and I think that you know, I'm a millennial, at least for my cohort, at least in the United States, millennial men have been socialized originally to view consent just through a legalistic perspective. Like, did you get consent or not in terms of, you know, did you follow the law? And I think the Me Too movement is great in part because it is broadening our dialogue around what constitutes consent in a moral sense and not merely a legal sense, where consent is something that is not merely given, but something that ought to be maintained enthusiastically in order for people to continue to have sexual relations. And the Aziz Ansari case really does show some of the failures of viewing consent as, oh, you've got it and now that's it, you know? And in his case, of course, there was more to it. I mean, there was sexual coercion in the sense that he kept harassing Grace, who, uh, you know, had attempted to withdraw consent by signaling to him and him, you know, sort of pressing the issue. But uh, in, in addition to the benefits of having a Me Too conversation, I'm also interested in ways that uh, the right has kind of co-opted some of this important identity politics language. Um, so we've got a couple questions about that, if you're, if you're game for that. Yeah, let's go. Recently on your channel, I, I, and correct me if I'm wrong on this, I believe um, the, the concept was intersectional fascism you talked about on, <laughs> in a channel. And I, I thought that was really interesting, if you could go into that a little bit. Yeah, it was more of a joke. Uh, I, I did an appearance on Polite Conversations, and we were talking about the women of the alt-right and this really, what am I call it, I guess, ironic um, episode that happened a few months ago now where we jokingly called it the woman question. Several women from the alt-right movement spoke up about the fact that they were experiencing a lot of harassment in terms of uh, their own followers saying, why aren't you pregnant yet? Why are you on YouTube? You should be having babies, right? White replacement, the great replacement. And they were saying, you know, don't harass us about this. You know, these are personal issues. And, um, and then also there's this, this, I am the trend for people who are, who have non white ethnicity in their background. You know, maybe their grandparent was a non white ethnicity or someone else uh, also being all um, alt right and, and somehow thinking that they can kind of claim participation in the white ethno state despite not being, you know, like, pure white in the sort of German Aryan sense that we tend to think about the way those things are framed. And we were just joking in this hangout about, yeah, you know, we're, you've got intersectional fascism here where people want to bring in different parts of themselves and, you know, do it, do have be a white supremacist, but do it through the lens of having an Asian background or feminists in, or not feminists, but women sort of saying, hey, you know, we have a right to speak. And it was, it was funny because, you know, they had this whole conversation, a bunch of men talking about whether or not it was okay for women to speak. <laughs> and, and so it, it is interesting the way that Oh, and also the role of, um, there are quite people who are on the far right and maybe even alt uh, right, but still have some sympathy for trans people because they like a particular trans person. And this is all, and, and the thing, you know, if you look at too, at, at fascist Germany, it was very anti uh, homosexuality in any way. And yet, I, I'm sure that there are parts of it, uh, parts of the alt right movement that are also just extremely homophobic, but you also get some people who are kind of walk that line of race realism, but also being for marriage equality. And so it's like a really we have a kind of strange time. But I think we also have to look at the fact that fascism in North America and Western Europe right now, it doesn't have a power base. And so they really can't regulate their own ideology. And I think everyone who says, you know, if these people ever got power, it would be just like what happened in Nazi Germany, which is that you increasingly get purity tests and people get weeded out and weeded out and enforcement expands and expands. So currently, of course, it's in the alt-right's interest to have as many people as possible saying their rhetoric or advocating that they have a space to talk about their issues um, or even promoting the idea of an ethnostate, even if they wouldn't be part of it just the idea of it, you've got the right to speak free speech. But uh, that's only, and they're perfectly happy to welcome those people in when they have no real power. But um, if they got real power, things would change very quickly. On the issue of uh, challenging patriarchy in society, 
This issue is personal to me as well, because I, in my context, I grew up within a Roman Catholic conservative tradition and uh, went to Catholic school in elementary school and part of middle school, went to really radical conservative Latin masses, um, non-English masses, but in Latin because of how conservative we were um, when I was in college. And consequently, I, I really have a history where I bought into a lot of uh, Catholic conservative patriarchal rhetoric as it relates to um, homosexuality and as it relates to women's rights and gender roles broadly. And only later in life did I come to get educated on these issues and understand um, that there is a moral responsibility to dismantle patriarchy in society and embrace feminism and progressivism in general. Um, so my question is, you know, how do we treat people like me? And, and I'll, I'll ask also about uh, Cenk Uger of the Young Turks. Cenk Uger is a figure who has held deeply misogynist views in the past, but who has spent the many years since championing progressive causes like feminism. So what do we do in a situation where people do have sort of a problematic history, but uh, really want to be an ally and really want to, you know, not being able to change the past, but moving forward in the future, really want to be um, socially responsible and socially just here? I think if people are your allies, you should accept them as allies. It doesn't, you know, sort of, it doesn't really matter what you did in the past. If you say, you know what, I used to think that, then I thought about it. I was really wrong. Um, I thought about it some more. And I think I, I, I kind of agree with you where you want to go. Uh, why would you give, I mean, that, I know that from um, a tactical point of view, there are going to be people from the other side of the aisle who might s snipe uh, and bring this up again and again. And there might be purists who, you know, sort of like, I'm done with you. I never, you know, it doesn't matter what you do. You could never say sorry enough. I, that's it. Like, I never want to hear from you again. But I don't, one, I don't think we should let our enemies define who our allies are on the first point. And second, if you do those kinds of purity tests, you're just going to be stood on your own, um, you know, with your own little sign and accomplishing nothing politically. So I'm a, I'm a pragmatist. I'm very much an American, come from that tradition in that way. Uh, if someone agrees with me on eight out of 10 issues, I'm happy to work with them on eight out of 10 issues and then fight them tooth and nail on the last two. Um, I can draw that line in my head. And especially people who have changed their mind. I actually think those people have a more important role in the movement than people who never had to have their minds changed because they, people who have never had to change their minds on those issues don't know what it's like to have the self-doubt and the worry and the questioning and rethinking everything you've done throughout your life. And that there is probably, a, a, you know, a lot of emotional mechanisms to prevent those kinds of progressions, the kind of development in your thought from happening. So people who have changed their minds are actually, I think, some of the most important people. Eli Bosnick is an example. He talks a lot about how important it is. It was his friends who were very kind and patient and talked him out of his bigotries, you know, kind of like he would say them and they would talk about it and unpack them and he would think about it and come back and do more. And and so I actually think that um, you and and like myself, I'm a recovering Catholic, but on the atheist, you know, uh, way more so than the moral way. Uh, we can relate to people who haven't made those steps yet or who are making those steps in a way that no one, someone who hasn't gone through that process could possibly do. Yeah, well, I'm so glad that you feel that way. I'm also glad that you brought up Eli Bosnick because Julian and I actually went to high school with Eli Bosnick. Uh, we're from Binghamton, New York. Yep. So uh, I knew I knew Eli back then. Uh, I was president of debate club when Eli was in it. So uh, I remember <laughs> oh, him wow. back back in those days. Wow. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, I really, really like I, I love Eli like a little brother. Um, I think he's he's great. I have great affection for him, and I think he uh, does. I, I know the whole MythCon thing was really tough on him, but more so than anyone when, he, you know, he inspired me to do more talks with people on the other side and rethink. I mean, there are people who cross the line and I'm like, once you cross that line, I don't want to hang out with you. But for people who are toeing the line, I've become uh, a bit more patient and willing to reach out. And I, you know, I direct that credit toward Eli. I want to wrap up with the question, where can people find you? How can people best connect with your work? Sure, I'm on YouTube, but uh, what I would recommend is don't just look up Christy Winters and then look at all the videos because being a feminist online gets you a lot of hate. So there's a lot of hate, hate videos out there uh, about me. So I would recommend if you put in Christy Winters channel, you'll see my channel. It's uh, sort of like about 6,500 subs right now. 
I recently did a hangout with my friend, a Blissful Melancholy, who's a, a really chilled out and cool anarchist. And we talked about the Women's March and we talked about anarchism and, and her thoughts on it. I gave some of my critiques as a more of a social democrat. And I also am trying this radio show that I'll be recording. Uh, it seems like Saturday mornings is a good time to record where I talk about usually current events, sometimes some YouTube drama and anything else I find interesting. So they usually run about 30 minutes in length. And uh, if that sounds good, it's kind of nerdy, NPR-ish, but YouTube drama to kind of content. <laughs> All right. That's great. Well, this has been a really great discussion and I'm so happy that you've joined us here. Christy Winters, appreciate it. And I uh, hope you'll continue to fight the good fight like we will. Oh, definitely. And I hope to be back on and maybe have you guys on my channel for a chat too. I would absolutely love that. Thanks so much. All right. Thanks. We'd like to thank Jamie Willard for providing background music. You can find more of his music on YouTube and the links in the description. Adam Schultz for the design of the Pineal Express logo, and Billy McKeska for audio production. If you found the discussion interesting today, please consider rating Pineal Express on your podcast app, or better yet, writing us a positive review. Ratings and reviews are the single best way you can support our podcast. Thanks for listening. The opening theme was composed, performed, and produced by Strange Fang Song Factory. James Wright Glasgow of Strange Fang Song Factory has created affordable music for films, commercials, businesses, dance companies, cheerleading teams, summer camps, synchronized swimmers, this podcast, and a circus. Whatever it is you do exactly, you should probably have a soundtrack. Visit strangefangs.com or call 607-743-743. 2633 to get started.